In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So a month or so ago, when Randolph and I got together to plan out uh, our preaching schedule, I was not scheduled to preach today because it's my birthday. Uh, but I had something come up where I needed to revise the schedule, so I asked Randolph, I said, do you mind if I preach this Sunday? Have you started working on it? And uh, uh, Randolph was incredibly gracious and said, absolutely, not at all. And uh, I begin to wonder whether he looked ahead and saw the gospel and, uh, and thought, no, I don't want to touch that one. <laughs> Episcopalians aren't quite sure what to do with those apocalyptic readings. And this is called Mark's mini apocalypse. I struggle with it uh, for two reasons. One's theological that I'll get into it. And the other is I don't particularly want something cataclysmic to happen. Uh, even if the promise is absolutely beyond my imagination, I'm kind of attached to the life I have. It's not perfect. There are people who have more. There are people who, um, who probably have a, a happier life. But I have a very good life. And I'm happy with what I have. And I'm not quite eager to roll the dice. But it is a very difficult reading. Uh, William Willimon, the bishop and Methodist preacher and uh, dean at Duke for about 20 years, uh, he talked about it in terms of a story uh, that, he, that happened to him early in his ministry. He said uh, he was taking a church on a mission trip um, uh, to Honduras. And as they were gathered around, uh, they were working on a clinic. Uh, and at the clinic, there were, um, there were staff and, and obviously patients. And, uh, and that evening, as they were all gathered around, uh, one of them suggested that they all go around uh, and, and um, talk about their favorite biblical verse. Uh, and he got a little nervous because he said, us Methodists, we're not that great at quoting scripture. Uh, and he was afraid that it would really uh, show the shortcomings of his uh, spiritual leadership. Uh, but they all went around and most of them picked really familiar ones. You know, the prodigal son, uh, the story of the good Samaritan, um, the lost coin, you name it. Uh, the Beatitudes, uh, John 3.16. And... Uh, uh, and they got around the, the circle, and then um, a Honduran woman uh, who was there uh, started to describe the 13th chapter of Mark. And Wilmon wasn't quite sure what to do about that. It was an odd, odd favorite reading. And so he asked uh, one of the nurses who, uh, who was also helping them to, to, to translate, uh, what's this about? And the nurse said, this woman has lost three children to malnutrition. That God has bigger dreams for her than her current life is life-saving. That God is invested in her and has big dreams, and this is not the end of her story, is huge. And so this reading about God having something else in store, about God not being finished, gives her hope. And it gives her a sense that her dreams uh, in God's eyes are as big as anyone else's. And so he looks at this passage differently from that point of view. Now let's take a look at what's happening, because I do think a, looking at this particular story needs to be framed with the story that happens before it and the story that happens right after it. So right before this story is the story of the widow that we heard last Sunday putting her last two coins in the world in the coffer. And we've heard plenty of other stories about the temple being used to keep people out, to determine who was holy, who had prepared and exchanged their money properly. It was a place that limited the ability to God to spread out into other people's lives, uh, to help other people realize God's dreams for them. Uh, and so it was a scathing comment about the temple, uh, but not necessarily about the building itself. And they were looking at the building, they were uh, some distance away, and they're looking at it, and in, uh, just seeing the remains of it, it is incredible. There are stones, individual stones, that are about 40 feet wide uh, and weigh over 30 tons. I mean, it is an architectural marvel that they were able to do this. Uh, and it was often uh, gold-plated with, uh, uh, and, and supposedly from a distance, it just sort of stunned your eyes uh, to see how incredible this was. Uh, and he points to it and he says, 
this will be toppled. Every single stone uh, will be torn down. And, um, and it's worth noting that this is written at a time uh, when this was taking place. Uh, Rome was, uh, uh, was at war with the, uh, with, with the Jews, uh, and the temple was, was, had been destroyed uh, by the time this was, uh, was, was actually written. Uh, but it talks about the fact that something new would happen. Uh, that something new and restorative uh, and, and life-giving that would allow God's dreams to spill out into other people's lives uh, in a new way. Um, and then um, it goes from there, the passage right after it, transitions to the walk towards the cross. Like most apocalyptic literature, it isn't talking about something that hasn't happened. It's talking about a current reality amidst the chaos God is still there. God is still at the helm. God's dreams are bigger than this moment in time. I think the incarnation and Jesus' saving work at the cross is the summary of what takes place inside this, this passage. That God answers people's cries. God answers people's, why me? By meeting them in their human condition. The incarnation and the walk to the cross is God's answer to the chaos, the wars, the famines, uh, this woman's broken dreams. So the apocalypse isn't about something that we predict what's going to happen. It's about our alertness uh, to God working in and through our lives uh, in amazing ways. And as I think about it, um, I think about our responsibility. And a lot of people, uh, as they turn on the news, have decided uh, that, uh, and I get, I get people asking me quite regularly, do you think this are, these things that we see on the news, do you think these events going on, the wildfire uh, fires out west, the, uh, the political discourse, all of these things are signs of the end times? Uh, I don't. But I think they're very similar to what was going on in the first century uh, that God was responding to. And that in the chaos, God comes and stands uh, and tells us this is not the end of the story. There is more to come. And I was in Haiti, and I, uh, I was, as I was leaving, I was excited to, uh, to think when I got back in a week how much work they would uh, be able to do on the, on, on the school uh, and what it would look like when I got back. Um, and, uh, and, and one thing I you know, we think we take for granted, the number of people who come into this building for the first time and just... Uh, just marvel at how beautiful this space is, uh, how wonderful and rich this space is. Um, uh, it was juxtaposed uh, to what we experienced in Haiti. Uh, and one, uh, it was almost a, a, it was a snafu. I, uh, I was getting a tour of a school uh, when we were in Haiti by the, the priest, and he, uh, he took me into what, uh, took all of us into what was essentially uh, the kind of pavilion you might see at a summer camp, an outdoor pavilion uh, where you might play basketball or, or four square under it. it it had a metal roof uh, and just enough framing. Um, and then um, it did have walls up to about this high that were just uh, um, plywood that was sort of just wrapped around it. And he said, this is our school. Um, and he talked about how they divided into different groups within this open space. Um, and I knew it was a church and school, and so I was looking around for another building. Uh, and I asked, well, well, where's the church? And he looked kind of hurt. And he, looked over and I saw in the corner there was a little altar table on the far corner that gets moved out and uh, this was their church and their school and I thought back to what we have here and I thought God has the exact same dreams for these people for this church and this school that God has for us the piece of it that we need to be aware of is that that's the work that we're called to do we're called to help God's dreams get realized to be alert, to be attentive to where God is calling us to act and to be differently in the world. One of the responses that people have to this apocalyptic literature uh, is to kind of sit, is to kind of sit and let God do God's work. Why should we care about the earth if it's all going to, uh, uh, to, to end in, in some uh, apocalyptic moment? Uh, why should we seek justice if it's all going to end in some uh, God-driven moment? Uh, why do we do the work of the church uh, if in the end it's all in God's hands to come and correct all the wrongs in the world? I don't think it works that way. I think this literature is a reminder uh, that God is in the world, that God is still working God's ways in the world, and I think God desperately depends on us uh, to help do that. If the temple was a place that was helping people realize that God had bigger dreams for them, 
If the temple was a place that helped share the good news, that helped uh, right the boat, that helped uh, give peace and calm uh, and hope within the chaos, I don't think Jesus would be talking about its destruction. I think when a widow comes and leaves poorer than, they, than when she arrived, when the place becomes in and of itself a container for God and not something that spills out, that's when God challenges it. So we live in, in kind of chaotic times. And I think that's the time where this passage is most important, where we realize that God is still at the helm. But we're in the nave. We're in the boat. And the work of this church and the work of this school is to go out into the world and to bring peace to storms, to bring hope to the hopeless, and to help people realize God's enormous dreams for their lives. Amen.